Hello, prisoners and politicians. My name is TV's Guy, and welcome back to the boss designs of Dark Souls 2. It's been a bit since the last episode, so a little reminder. Last time, we managed to make our way through the Sinner's Rise and met the Lost Sinner, an iron-masked prisoner ensconced in a deep cell in a very dark prison. And having defeated them, we acquired what was called a Great Soul and found a primal bonfire, whatever the hell that means. So now, we have returned to Majula to kind of get our bearings and reset a little bit after the boss fight and start to look for whatever may be next. And oh boy! Some things are definitely gonna be next. So, is that snarky magic dude gonna be hanging around somewhere? And what about the, the church lady? Or the, the, the praying monk girl? How the hell do you get down there, I wonder? Do you really just have to jump? Oh god. Need a lot of health for that. Maybe that cartographer guy is back. Like, surely he... Or else he's just out in the world somewhere for me to find. Oh, hello. Oh, hello again. You've made it. The map, I presume. Of course. Wait, there's more lights on this than there were before. So it says giant here. Bug. So does it light up with bosses I kill? Do you have anything new? I've killed a big boss. Oh yeah, you do. Oh! Oh, sh That's boss armor. Mask of the Lost Sinner increases equip load. Oh, oh, that's tempting. The spikes pointing inward suggest that this was not only used to bind prisoners, but to torture them as well. Straight jacket of the Lost Sinner. A tightly cinched belt presses against the waist. By now, no one knows what this was used to punish or for what reason. Yeah. Hand restraints of the Lost Sinner. Increases power of pyromancy. Oh. Tempting. And a tattered skirt that the guilty wear in shame. That's a little bit tempting. Probably not a great idea to buy this, though, because I want to see my mustache! Let's just... Let's just pump some... Yeah. Okay. I can, <laughs> I can get my agility to 100, which is tempt- because if I'm gonna be doing this without a shield, if I want to try to make this work without a shield, my roll needs to be less crap. So we'll do that for now. So that seemed to be full a full exploration of the Bastille. Probably, I mean, there's probably a bunch of secrets I missed, but I think that's all the bosses anyway? Which might mean it's time to look for a new direction to go in. Is the church lady then back at the tower still, and I just didn't see her? Sure doesn't look like it. Wait, what about those flying guys? Because, like, they were out here, and I thought I was going to be going to fight them. And they flew over there, so are they over in that tower or something? Oh, right, he's here. All right, jackass. Why does something explode when he shows up? I've beaten you once, I can do it again. There we go. <laughs> Finally. Oh, geez, 6,000. That's actually not bad. Okay. Eh. I still feel like going that way would be end in my death, and I don't want to die somewhere where I can't get back to my souls. Eh. But there was like a place, I remember, there was a place where I was walking on a walkway and I could jump down to some houses and stuff. And I didn't, because, you know. Was it over here? Yeah, yeah, it was here. Maybe I could go here. And then maybe there's a safe way to jump down, I don't know. Hello. <laughs> oh, I know this one. I know that from the village. Is it gonna be a corpse? Oh, no! 
Not corpses, but... An armor set. Hooray! Oh! All right. We have a place to move on from now. Right, okay, well, just fuck ah! that. Just fuck that. I'm, no, I'm sick of it. I've been walking around in circles for an hour. I, because I, I'm so stubborn, I want to go back and keep looking. But I also feel like if, if I'm just spending another hour walking in circles, it's like... Okay. All right. All right. Fine. 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 Um, let me just check something. I still have some fragrant branches. So why don't we go use those? Wake up, asshole. Time to die. Can't kill him yet, can't kill him yet, can't kill him yet, can't kill him. Kill him! Oh, I have to do it with... Oh, hey! <laughs> A way around. Let's see. You, you. Give us food. Yes, you. Give us Suki. Hello, troll. Oh, there's more than one of him. Can you follow me over this? No! Ha-ha! Get cheese, dumbass! Oh! I thought he had something like that. Oh my god! Really? Yeah. Really? The f yeah. pursuer! Oh! <laughs> Son of a bastard. God damn. The pursuer. Son of a bitch. That's a floating coffin. Well, all right. Let's, um... Let's play Monkey Island. The what? Oh, hello again. There we go. Jerk. The nature of your being has changed. And also, all the enemies have respawned, apparently, except for the big guys. Thank God. What does that mean? Did that go more hollow? Is that it? No, I still have the same health. Hmm. Wait, what the f- Where's my mustache? Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can I can just change genders apparently. Oh, 
spam trans rights in chat, please. <laughs> oh, I was so confused. Oh man, and here was I thinking, okay, the coffin boat is gonna take me somewhere. And it did, it took me to a whole new world. Oh, that's, that's cool. Like that's okay, you can just do that. That's cool. Uh, it's not the mustache you have on the outside. It's the mustache you have on the inside. That's what matters. Hi, uh, Future Sky in here. Just gonna interrupt past me for a second, cause... That happened! Now, I wanted to leave analysis until the end of the video, but it just kinda didn't fit in there, so... Let's, let's have this one now. Uh, I just changed my gender. Not 100%. Intentionally, I mean, it did get into the coffin, but I thought it was gonna be a boat or something, but no, it's it's a gender change coffin, which... Okay, there's something to unpack there. So we've already talked extensively about how the imagery and themes of Dark Souls 2 seem to revolve in large part around personal identity and indeed transformation of personal identity, which is something that ties in quite naturally to the mechanics of a typical RPG, i.e. you can constantly be changing your outfit, your look, the way that you present yourself, as well as changing your stats to change what you literally are physically capable of. Dark Souls 2 goes the extra mile by also allowing you to respect your character over the course of gameplay so that even the choices you make about, like, the capabilities that you have are not permanent, and here, well, we find yet another aspect of our character's identity that isn't set in stone, that can be changed. What gets me about this transformation, though, is the method by which the game designers have chosen to allow it. It's not just that you go to a witch and say, hey, could you magic me up to the other gender thing? No, very specifically, you go to the shores of the water, which is also the way, of course, that you enter Drang Lake was through the water. So you go to the shores of the water and you find there a coffin, a vessel for the dead, and you put yourself in that coffin. And when you awake from a brief little nap under the lid there, you are changed into a different person. Symbolically, this is quite literally death and rebirth. And while I'm not an expert on the subject, I do know that among people who transition between genders in real life, there is often a discourse that kind of frames the pre-transition past self in language associated with death and coming into your own in the gender that you've chosen to be as a kind of rebirth into life. Like, for example, trans people will often talk about experiencing going through a second puberty or like coming into their own, almost like growing up all over again. Now, that's not universal, and I'm not sure FromSoft necessarily intended that particular connection, but my opinion, as ever, is that it doesn't really matter whether an author intended to put something into the work. What's interesting is whether you can construct a meaningful reading of the work based on the factors that may be there, even if those thematic overlaps are accidental. So while I suspect it's probably accidental that there is some thematic overlap between what Dark Souls 2 does with gender and how trans people sometimes talk about gender, the death and rebirth imagery is not accidental. Like, that's very- you go into a coffin by the shores of a lake and then you wake up as a different person. That's very much there. Now, one of the things I brought up in a previous episode is that if Dark Souls is very much about identity, then the journey through Dark Souls could be considered essentially a version of the journey through life, where you are born into Drang Lake, you are given help to develop yourself by leveling up by, well, women, first of all, by the three sisters in the house, your symbolic midwives, and then by the Emerald Herald, your symbolic, as it were, mother figure. And I thought, maybe that's a bit too far, like, maybe that's reading a little bit too much into it, in the sense that the text might not be able to support that interpretation, but here, the death and rebirth imagery is so specific here that I'm starting to think that maybe I'm onto something. Now, again, as I've talked about many times before, this is an interpretation of Dark Souls 2 that I'm constructing for you as we play. It is not the only possible interpretation. Anyway, TLDR. I think this is very cool. I think it ties in very nicely to some of the themes we've been discussing, and I'm sure we'll return to it later. And for the moment, I'm gonna stay a lady, because she looks handsome with those large, cool eyebrows, and I can always switch back later if I want. Shouldn't we all be so lucky as to have that freedom? The last idea I have for trying to find a boss at some point tonight is gonna go and unpetrify the lady up here. And maybe that guy will give me his sword. I want it. It's so cool. Okay, lady. Let's get you out of that situation. Oh, wow. Did she get knocked back? I guess the handle is cursed. Hello. <coughs> Thank you. I've been oh, petrified hard to speak. Give me 
I'm fine. I think. No, no, no. I'm fine. Really, I am. Um. My name is Rosabeth. Thank you so much for rescuing me. Oh. Oh. You're that traveler. I still haven't thanked you. Well, I'm quite a hand at pyromancy. So perhaps. I was attacked and turned to stone, I think. I owe you my life. If you had not come. Oh, I feel shameful. When? Um, I. But. Just look at me. Do you have any clip? I'll take anything. Anything at all. Just put it on the ground. Uh, sure. Be safe. You can have some stuff that I don't need. The handle is now free now. Well, clearing the way was your doing, was it? <laughs> Didn't think you had it in you, pal. No, no, no. That's not like it sounds. Well, you could have just gone and yeah, bought a that? fucking Please. branch, dude. Aye, that's all. Name's Ben Hart. Thanks to you, I can resume my journey. If we share the same path, I'll repay my debt to you in battle. And I swear it by my sword. The road ahead's gonna be long. But I'm here to help. <laughs> so are you gonna actually... Uh, just put it here. Oh, give equipment. Be safe. <laughs> Why does she say put it on the ground then? Well, all right. Uh, take a wanderer's hood and the imported tunic and the imported manchettes. No, I don't need them anyway. There you go. I have my vi His name is Corellian of the Fold, a famed sorcerer in Malfia. I was fascinated by sorcery. And so, well, he's so unique, you see. When he set out for Drang Lake, I couldn't let him go alone. But we were separated quite early on, I'm afraid. I'm rather unskilled, and the Lord probably ditched me. But oddly, I'm a fast learner when it comes to pyromancy. What we're fascinated by, and we're skilled at, are not always the same thing. Oh, why can't I just focus on what I truly enjoy? Relatable. Thank you. After I change into this, I'm heading for Majula. Hmm. I'm not sure where I might find the Lord, but perhaps Majula is my best chance. Alright. I hope I don't get petrified by this. Oh my f oh. god! Oh, there's the bastard. Mother f mamma mia! Mother f oh. from soft. Honestly. Okay, let's see what we can find out here then. Wait, what? Stay calm and then message. Visions of message and then message. <laughs> oh, oh, gank squad. Are you throwing stones at me? Jerks. I can throw shit too, asshole. Soul of a proud knight. Human effigy. Neat. Uh. Just a ghost. Okay. That was soon. Not that I mind, but that was soon. That makes me suspicious. Ooh, what's that statue? She's standing among flower buds. And holding flowers to her chest. I wonder if that means anything. Hmm. Try jumping, then hurrah for bow. Oh, that looks scary. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang off on going into the misty bit for just a sec. Friend ahead, but enemy ahead. What? 
You look like a ghost! Oh, piss off! What the f*** are you? I thought it was a player ghost. Hmm. Seek mightier souls. Uh, all right. Hmm. But there's nothing else here for me right now, because I need mightier souls. So I guess I come back here when I have slain all four of the big ones. Oh, what are you? Ghost dogs? Oh, okay. Not especially powerful. But they've probably got a more powerful friend somewhere up here. <laughs> yeah. No! Oh, well, I'm oh, I'm 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 extremely dead. Get cheesed. I'm not having you eat my head again. Oh, hello. That looks like one of those King Vendrick doors. I'm guessing I can't go through there. Produce the symbol of the king. Okay, so this is basically like the equivalent of those Lord Vessel doors in Dark Souls 1 that you just can't open. So I guess I need to kill the four... And then I can go see King Vendrick. And then when I... I meet or kill him, probably kill if we're honest, then I can use his thing to go through those doors. That's what it looks like anyway. Okay, fine. We'll do the spooky bit. Spookity boogity. I'm bringing a torch. Is that the thing it is? Like, it's the thing where if you have a torch, then the mist isn't so bad? Nope! You have absolutely got to be sh** me. No! No, 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 just hit him one more time, you dickhead. Okay, there. Oh, mother f Okay. Well, I have no idea what direction I'm going right now. Well, so far, so still alive. And I'm right back where I started. Okay. Yay, I'm through it! Yay! <laughs> Yay! No more ghosts, please. Bonfire, yes! Oh. Is that an onion knight? No! Oh, close. No, it's not. It's not an onion knight, but... Okay. <laughs> Hidden path ahead, huh? Let's check that. That's a wheelchair. How many are there? Go away. Piss off. Another lockstone. Excellent. What the frick? Is that a scorpion person? Well, that seems easy enough to deal with. Just don't go down there. It also looks asleep, kind of. Oh, this is some very large claws. I'll deal with you later. Another petrified person. And this one's blocking a goddamn treasure chest. 
Be wary of pointless. So there's no point on petrifying him? Hmm. Well, I couldn't do it even if I wanted to. Oh, oh, oh! Oh, oh, those aren't NPCs, those are enemies. Oh, I see. Not a lot of action in these areas, like just a bunch of annoying jars. Let's just move on. There has to be a boss around here somewhere. Oh, there's also the scorpion guy. I don't want to fight him though. He's clearly not a boss. He's just going to kill me now. That might be a boss on the other hand. Boss ahead, therefore try fire. Aha! Aha! What? Oh! She casts spells at me! They? It? Yeah, I I was guessing that it would pro- Oh, yeah. Oh, double scorpion tail! Hello! I guess we found the Quelag of this game. She's actually a lot like Quelag. I think I can see them moving. Uh-oh. And I probably shouldn't let them get under me. Should I? No! Oh, mother yeah. Oh, boy. Okay, you cannot dodge that at close range. Oh, she's got a skull amulet around her neck. So contrasting her to Quelag, by the way... Like, where Quelag is, is riding atop this disease spider, basically, like this... This thing that looks kind of wrong and terrible, uh, like, raw with wounds and pulsating and blah. This lady is riding atop what looks to be a perfectly healthy normal scorpion. So I guess she jumps out immediately if you come close. Yep, I should probably get out of there. <laughs> that didn't do much. And then there's this spell. Okay, let's see. Like that, and then like that. Okay, it's dodgeable. Fuck. So was that, but I didn't. <laughs> because of some reasons. No! That wasn't a lot of damage. So I guess if I hit her shell or her carapace, that means I don't do damage. Why couldn't I roll? Yeah. I have to I have to hit her body, otherwise it doesn't do anything. Right. Okay. Her human body. Oh, claws. Little claws. Okay, 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 okay. So green dominates her color scheme. Uh, what do you mean with the brown, of course, there, but this, she's got a greenish tint, I think, even on her... Even on her human body and her human flesh. Oh, f Hmm. I feel like I'm actually doing more damage with the crossbow. <laughs> Okay. Okay, this time we'll dodge it. 
she can't come out under rock, maybe? Is that it? Yeah, okay, that works. Cool. So it does seem that there is sort of a kind of safe area right in front of her. Sort of semi... Much like there was with Quelag, actually. Where she kind of can't reach you. Okay, almost there, almost there. Almost there. So... Now, the thing is about her is... Oh, my f God! She decided to come close instead. So, the thing about her, though, is that... She's all, like... She's not... There's not very... There's no alteration to the scorpion form, right? It's it's just a straight up scorpion with a with a with a human body attached as a centaur arrangement basically. But much like with the uh, I wonder if there's a correlation between cuz like she had the two tails, like that that split in her body in the same way that the uh sentry thing had. And I wonder about that. Oh, tell me some of these are NPCs and not enemies. Oh, that's an enemy. Uh, it's def- Is that a mammoth? Is that an elephant, man? That's exactly what it is. Oh, that's a pretty cool character design. That's a really cool character design. God damn. Mastodon Great Shield. Nice. And that's a dwarf? Oh, hello. You remind me of someone I met where some pirates were hanging out. Sorry about that, dude. Gurum, great hammer. Shield of the primal knights that defend Drang Lake Castle. Very heavy and has the power of lightning. Oh. The brutish and mighty primal knights wield the shield as if it were made of paper. But to the ordinary warrior, it is a chore to even hold it up owing to its great weight. Whatever was created by Lord Aldia was lost with his disappearance, but the king attempted to revive these things, even if only fragments remained. So primal, huh? Like the bonfire. Hey, speaking of bonfires. And appropriately not enough, we're venturing deep into a cave system of some sort. So, let's head back to Majula and sum up Nakia, this, the, the scorpion lady. Sheila must have dropped a soul, right? Yes, Scorpioness Nakia. Nakia was born of the misdeeds of an ancient being, a frail soul from the beginning that soon succumbed to madness. The misdeeds of an ancient being. Okay, so like immediately I think Seath, because Seath made so many animal-human hybrid monsters, which would require us to accept that this is in the Dark Souls 1 timeline, and Scorpion as Nakia just managed to survive for that long. That being said, aesthetically, she doesn't really fit a Seath creation so much, I think. But this is a different game, so no, yeah, who knows? Well, mm, yeah, I mean, I'm sure someone who cares more about the, the, the lore and the continuity and stuff would be able to speak to that. As far as I'm concerned, it's not very interesting if she's a creation of Seath, if Seath isn't in this game. But it's an interesting little lore tidbit. I would be more interested in her as a representation of a vision of femininity in this particular game. Or indeed, again, with the split tail thing. Another split metaphor going on. Because I do know that, like, two-tailed comets and stuff like that, like, things that have two tails, there's some kind of folkloric resonance there, which I'd have to look into. Well, we'll see about that. So, Scorpionus Nakia. Now, I already made the obvious comparison during the gameplay because the comparison is so obvious to anyone who's played Dark Souls 1. Nakia, it seems, 
is this game's Quee lag, and there are some worthwhile comparisons to make there, specifically about the ways in which the game frames these two rather similar characters, both of them half-woman and half-arachnid monster, both of them naked and rendered quite attractively, both of them using long weapons to give them reach from atop their high perch on their monster lower half. But what's somewhat more interesting is the contrasts between them, because look how the camera frames Quee lag. And now look how the camera frames Nakia. What? Oh! In introducing Quilag, Dark Souls 1 really wants us to know that she's a naked lady. That's hey, there's a sexy lady on top of that spider, and she's got boobies, and she's got a seductive smile on her face, and she's all adorable and seductive. With Nakia, it's more like, Hey, hang on, is that half of a woman sticking out of the sand? Oh god, she's casting spells! And therein lies an interesting commentary on the power of framing to establish a relationship between a viewer and a character in any given visual medium. Quilag's framing plays up her femininity. It's like, oh, sexy lady, also spider, but sexy lady, but also spider. Like, it plays up that contrast and establishes that, yes, you're supposed to see the lady as sexy and attractive so that you can have a greater contrast with the monster that constitutes the lower half of her body. With Nakia, the camera doesn't pan lovingly over her sexual and attractive features in order to establish that relationship with the viewer. She's just kind of poking out of the sand, and then if you get close, boom, scorpion. And this is not like a value judgment comparison. I'm not saying, oh, the Quilag thing is evil because male gaze and stuff, and the Nakia thing is good because no sexualization. No, as ever, sexualization is a tool that you can use in character design, and I happen to think that it's used very effectively with Quilag specifically. What I'm pointing out here is that there's a difference in approach which creates a difference in the relationship between us, the viewer, and the character on screen. And the natural question that that leads us to is, well, what is Nakia to us? Because we talked about before how the last giant, all beaten, broken, and battered, and consumed by raging madness, is kind of a mirror of what happens to human beings who go hollow and also start attacking everything around them. And we've talked about how the Pursuer, as a hyper-efficient killing machine, acts as a kind of dark mirror to the player themselves when they are behaving at their most efficient as a player. With the Dragon Rider and the Ruin Sentinels, we talked about how their personal identity gets lost in the identity of their uniform, their function within the power structure, and for the Lost Sinner, an identity that has been taken away by decades, if not centuries, of solitary, mind-eroding confinement. All of them can be read as a kind of metaphor for challenges to identity, or indeed identity crisis, the various things that can threaten our perceptions and our ability to hold on to who we are and who we want to be. Now, again, because I always get comments about this, this is not the only possible reading of Dark Souls 2. This is not the correct reading or the secret hidden meaning behind Dark Souls 2. It is a possible reading of the game. Other ones are possible too, and I'm sure we'll talk about those before the end of this series. For the moment, the question was, what is Scorpion as Nakia in this particular reading of the story? Well, she's not unlike the Flexile Sentry, in a way. The Flexile Sentry, as it were, is two people trapped in one body. Nakia, then, is sort of the mirror image of that, which is one person split between two different bodies, two different states of being. The human and the monstrous. Now, this particular contradiction in terms is at the heart of a lot of literature and a lot of movies and a lot of absolutely terrible teenage poetry written by me, because it is the struggle to reconcile our own darkest impulses and our worst qualities with the person who we want to be and the person that we like to think that we really are. Am I really all of my anger, all of my most toxic personality traits, or am I the person who's trying to deal with those things and not become defined by them? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Incredible Hulk and Bruce Banner, Smeagol and Gollum, Harvey Dent and Two face Spider-Man and the Venom symbiote. And yes, it's a popular trope in pop culture and children's media because it's an easy and accessible way to dramatize the conflict between doing what you want and doing what you know you are supposed to, but the deeper level there is also that it strikes at the heart of a really, really important question. 
how many of the things that I hate about myself are inseparable from myself. However, Nakia is not quite that, because Nakia isn't in conflict with all the worst parts of herself. She has fully become them. There is no conflict between the scorpion and the woman. The scorpion and the woman are one. And her soul tells us why. She was born of the misdeeds of an ancient being, a frail soul from the beginning that soon succumbed to madness. Nakia, much like the last giant, was broken by her circumstances, by the trauma that was inflicted on her by those who made her, by her parents, or parent singular in this case. And so the way to read Nakia is someone who was inflicted with monstrous traits by the people who made her, who was literally turned into a monster by her parents, and who has ultimately become consumed by that, who has ultimately become one with the monstrous parts of her, all of her worst qualities. This is why the lair in which we find her is a sandy cave where she can borrow and hunt because, well, she has become the scorpion. She has become the monster. Now, the reason why I'm so sure that Nakia could have turned out a different way, that she didn't need to become what she became is, well, Tark didn't. Now, we didn't get to talk to Tark, who is the scorpion man with the big blue claws, who I avoided during this episode, but I do talk to him a little bit later in some footage that I've already recorded, and since I have that special future knowledge, I'm gonna bring it back and use it a little bit in this particular analysis. Once I figure out how to talk to Tark, one of the things he tells me is that he and Nakia are the same sort of creature. I think he calls her his better half. But Tark isn't insane or hostile. He's not consumed by the monster. He hasn't become only the scorpion. He's a demonstration that Nakia might have turned out different. If things hadn't been the way they were, there could have been a very different person there. And that is the tragedy of Nakia. And indeed, all people who become consumed by their worst and most toxic qualities, it doesn't have to turn out that way. No one's born to become a monster. We grow into those roles, and we can often be nudged into those roles by the people who are most supposed and who have the greatest responsibility to take care of us, to keep the monster at bay. But sometimes those people are consumed by the monster too, and so that is the only thing they can pass on. Now, if it does turn out that Nakia is a creation of Seath, which is sort of what I'm kind of getting the feeling might be going on, then there's definitely a conversation to be had about generational trauma and the ways in which madness and abuse can filter down through the generation and haunt the world long after the people who perpetrated it are gone and buried and even forgotten. But for the moment, I'm not really sure that that's what's going on, so we'll leave that for a future video. Hey, thank you very much for watching another episode of The Boss Designs of Dark Souls 2. This one took a while. A lot of stuff got in the way. That happens. So, with Scorpionish Nakia out of the way, that's the last boss I managed to record footage of the last time I was streaming Dark Souls 2, which means it's time to do it again. Now, it's not going to be right away, and I might put out an extra episode of The Boss Designs of Dark Souls before we do that with some other footage that I don't really know what to do with. I'll figure it out. But if you want to watch me recording this stuff live and see all my failures, like, without the editing, well, you know, stick around, subscribe to the channel, maybe keep an eye on my Twitter or join the Discord, because then you'll know. On a related note, by the way, if you want to watch the unedited versions of all of these episodes, they're all available over on my second channel, youtube.com slash 2bsky. There should be a link coming up on screen in just a moment. And over on that channel, I'm also doing several just let simple Let's Plays of video games like Final Fantasy VI, where I talk a lot about the history of the franchise and some of the grand ambitions that that game had, or The Outer Worlds, that RPG that came out recently, where I run around in space and scream about capitalism a lot. Those are available for you if you so choose. You can go and subscribe to that. You can also like, comment, and subscribe on this particular channel. All of those things are very helpful because numbers going up is the only thing that keeps YouTube channels alive these days, and we wouldn't all be sitting here asking you to like and subscribe if it wasn't actually kind of necessary. If you'd like to support the channel more directly, well, Patreon is right there for that. You can sign up for like a dollar a month if you want to and help me out that way. Or I have some tip jars down in the description. If you don't want to do like a monthly subscription thing, you can give me a one-time tip to say, hey, I've got three dollars right now. You can have them. You seem to be doing things on the internet so that you drink some coffee. You probably need it. With November kicking off, 
December is right on the horizon and Christmas present season is coming, so content creators like me need all the help we can get. But if you're not inclined to support me specifically, that's completely okay. The only thing I'll say is that even if you don't want to support me, Online content creators depend really, really strongly on direct support from their viewers. Ad revenue just doesn't pay very much to the point where a $1 donation can be the same as literally thousands of views on a video. So even though those amounts don't feel like very much, they actually do make a real difference in the lives of content creators. So if there are YouTubers or content creators whose work you enjoy, please consider supporting them directly when you can with whatever you can, because it makes so so much more of a difference than you think. Anyway, if you've not enjoyed this video and somehow you've managed to make it this far through it, well, there's a dislike button right down below where you can exercise all of those dark aggressions you have towards YouTube content creators who do not meet your standards. Go on, give in to it. Smack that dislike button as hard as you can. Make it suffer. Set that monster free.